Brand Buchananus USA egyik legdinamikusabban fejlődő közvélemény kutató cége, a Szignál tulajdonosa. Brent a tengeren túl elismert szakértője, többek között Donald Trump kampánya kapcsán is végeztek kutatásokat. Cégét a The New York Times az USA legpontosabb közvéleménykutató vállalatának nevezte. Az amerikai üzletember a Lunch Group ügynökség meghívására érkezett Magyarországra, hogy a Marketing Summit Hungary vendég előadója legyen. A Lunch Group kamerái előtt exkluzív interjúban beszélt, sosem hallott tengeren túli tapasztalatairól, például arról, hogy kutatási eredményeik megmutatták, hogyan lehetett volna akár megfordítani az amerikai elnök választás eredményét. We are very happy that you accepted the invitation of uh, Lunch Group to Budapest uh, for the Marketing Summit. And thank you so much for the interview. The first question is kind of obvious because we are sitting next to the Buda Castle in this wonderful environment. And uh, how do you like Budapest? And have you ever been to Hungary before? I have never been to Hungary. Uh, Budapest has been at the top of my travel list for a very long time. So uh, what a wonderful opportunity to not only come and, and be with my friends at the lounge group, but also to see this wonderful city. Um, and I haven't had a chance to get all the way around, but uh, it has already surpassed my expectations. Lots of celebrities has a kind of a fairy tale story, how they started their career as a waiter or waitresses. Uh, as I know, you also have something similar in your life. Yes. Uh, I served hamburgers and french fries for, <laughs> that's how I got started. And uh, it was at a restaurant called Steak and Shake. Um, and I actually ran into my wife there, but I didn't know it when she was younger uh, and I was in high school. It was some kind of uh, accident, as it, I remember. It was very much an accident, an embarrassing accident. Um, so part of being a server there was making the milkshake. So you had to make the milkshake yourself, put it on the tray and take it out to uh, the table. And there was a table full of very cute girls uh, about my age there were eight of them, and they all ordered milkshakes. So I was holding eight milkshakes on this tray and not thinking about the balance as I took them off and put them on the table. There was one left, and I took it off, and the whole milkshake went in this girl's lap, just all over her. And uh, about eight years later, uh, my wife was telling a story after we had gotten married, and she said, one time I was at Steak and Shake at the rest of this restaurant, and this boy spilled a milkshake all over my friend. And I said, did you not realize that was me? I spilled the milkshake all over your friend. <laughs> After eight years? Eight you... years, yes. Wow. I, didn't know, I didn't know her well, um, didn't realize she was at the table uh, where I made this mistake. You founded one of the most successful uh, polling and market research firm. Uh, what was your motivation to start this company and uh, what is the recipe of success? Uh, the best recipe for success is fail a lot, but fail fast. Make mistakes, be willing to try things, uh, and find a really good team. Um, the, where we are as a company has very little to do with me and a whole lot to do with the, the group of people that we've put together uh, and their willingness and their values. And uh, we actually got started as a political consulting firm. So in the United States, there are hundreds if not uh, thousands of small firms uh, of people who manage political races, because there's so many. We have 50 state congresses, we have uh, 535 uh, members of our US Congress, uh, and so there's lots of political races, and, and it's a multi-billion dollar business. Um, and so we began managing dozens of races. Uh, we were producing television ads and uh, mailers and digital advertisements, and then we, we kind of fell into polling, almost. Um, there are a lot of good pollsters, a lot of good uh, research firms in the U.S., but we just saw about 10 years ago that the way they were doing research was uh, soon going to be extinct. Um, and I think uh, that's been experienced here in Europe to an extent with GDPR, where it's just very challenging to even connect with somebody on a telephone uh, or through some other means where you're, you're interviewing them. And so we began to see this problem 10 years ago. Uh, and so we quit doing our other services and we put our energy into figuring out how do we fix this part of politics. And the reason we liked that part of it so much is because it's strategic. So the reason somebody hires a researcher is because they have questions that they need answered and they wanna know who to talk to, how to talk to them, where to talk to them, 
so that in the end you can change some outcome. Uh, and we have really enjoyed that part of the business. Uh, and when we, when we quit doing all these other services and we just honed in to just working on polling and research, that's when the company really began to explode. I listened to your podcast and you said the most important question is not what, it's why. Yes. What does it mean exactly? Well, what is an outcome? So they're going to vote for this candidate or this other party or they think that climate change is the most important issue. That's an outcome. What's more important to understand is why do they believe that? Why do they support that candidate? Because the only reason you conduct research is to change an outcome. You, you want to know where things are and you want to know how to move them to a different place that is more beneficial um, to whatever your objective is. And when you understand the why, that allows you to change the outcome. But not so much changing how they think or what their opinion is, but by understanding them better and understanding their motivations, that's how you create a connection to, to move them to a different place. And motivations are based by emotions. Definitely. Everything is based by emotions? All of our decisions based by emotions? Every single decision is based on emotions. It's not scary. It, it is, but, it, but it's also freeing in a way um, because you, you realize how those decisions are made. Uh, and you realize that uh, we're not as smart as we may think we are as people. Uh, we like to think we're very logical and that we go get information and we put this information together and then we make a decision. Um, and that's really just a lie we tell ourselves. Uh, because this emotional brain that we have deep inside of, of our, our brain is the one that is doing most of all the work for us in deciding, in deciding who we connect with. And you like this person over that person. That's not a logical decision. Uh, when you meet somebody and you have that initial reaction to, I think I'm going to like this person or I'm not sure we're going to get along, there's no logic involved in that. It is just your emotional brain making emotional decisions very quickly. Um, and that's, that's what it's good at, is making very quick decisions. The last one and a half year was an emotional roller coaster for everybody, mm -hmm. but I can imagine also for big companies, it was, a, it was a huge challenge how to manage their everyday life. How was it for you? How was it for your Washington DC office? How you were able to manage the everyday life in the pandemic? Yeah, that's a good question. So. One thing that businesses all do is they create contingency plans. So they say, if this happens, then we will do this. Uh, I'm not sure anybody had a contingency plan for a global pandemic. You know, it's been 100 years since the last true global pandemic came through. Uh, and so when it hit, it was, it was so shocking and jarring that uh, the, the companies that had a culture of flexibility were the ones who succeeded the most. Uh, and that really defines our team, is we're incredibly flexible uh, in being able to, to change on a dime, to just, we're going this direction and we can just turn completely another direction very easily. Um, and so with that, we, um, we had to change our office situation. Um, one thing that was really unique to, to our team and our office in Washington was that the pandemic uh, it made it really easy to get to the office because there was much less traffic. <laughs> uh, my, my drive went from about 45 minutes to 14 minutes. I still uh, went to the office, so we still, you didn't work from We had home. to spread out further. Mm -hmm. uh, we let people work from home if they chose to. They could come into the office if they wanted to um, because none of us were going anywhere else. So we weren't interacting with other people except at, at the office. And we had a large enough office to, to do that and to spread out. Um, what was actually a bigger challenge for us was the riots that occurred uh, in our city. And so uh, in June, there was a, a significant social upheaval in our country. Uh, and my office is two blocks from the White House. And uh, when they started burning cars in front of my office, I decided that was probably the time that we need to take a break uh, from the office as, uh, so our cars don't get burned. <laughs> How the American companies reacted for COVID? Uh, I know that in your Washington firm, what kind of modifications you made, but what in general you see in American companies, how they were reacted for this very unique situation? So one thing that we're starting to see in America is how important the employee is to the business. 
Uh, there are, and also corporations are now being drawn into politics, at least in America, more than they ever have before. Where they're, and it's because their employees are wanting them to, to engage, to take an activist stance um, for or against a, a policy. And, and this is something that uh, really, I think, came out of the pandemic, is the, the belief that companies have to take such good care of their employees um, because they're more fragile. You know, everybody's in this negative emotional state, or most people are. Um, and so that creates challenges around management uh, and, and also everything's political in America now. Everything is political. Uh, and so this has found its way into the American workplace, into the American company, where employees expect their company to do something about policy. This kind of change is not just in your firm, in other uh, big companies, uh, what uh, they made because of pandemic. What do you think they will stay with us? Uh, the working style will modify it forever? Yeah, there was a, a study that just came out this week, uh, an international study of employees. And one sixth of uh, the employees said if they were forced to go into the office, they would quit. Uh, and so uh, once you have a taste of something, it's very hard to to put that back in the box. Uh, and I think that um, there's uh, a lot of types of people that enjoy that flexibility. I think one thing that we're gonna see um, that will stay with us from this pandemic is more of a hybrid approach. So in the office some, um, working remote some. Um, uh, because one thing that is lost in, in complete remote work is those small interactions where you're going to get coffee together or when you run into each other in the hallway and you talk for a minute or two. Um, those type of, of interactions are really the relationship building aspect. It's not the work that builds the relationship, it's those small, quick interactions with your coworkers. Uh, and so that's why I think that, that hybrid work is going to be the future. So you've been involved in uh, very big projects, including Donald Trump's campaign. Uh, what kind of emotions did you observe there? Why they were important emotions there? Well, it's, it's first uh, important to look at the emotions that somebody has in general. So what is their current state, regardless of what they feel about a candidate or an issue um, or a brand? You have to understand where are they right now? How do they feel? Uh, and the, the American public is a lot of negative emotions uh, occurring. And so you, you have to look through that lens to understand what's going on politically with a candidate. Uh, and towards Donald Trump, it was very interesting because we actually have emotional data from the election four years before where he beat Hillary Clinton. And one thing that was uh, observed in that election is the fact that there were much stronger negative emotions towards Hillary Clinton than even Donald Trump. Um, especially among important voter groups. And so one thing that we saw in, uh, in Donald Trump's campaign is that seniors, so people who are 65 years and older, um, that usually that voter group, uh, they vote for the Republican. Not by a, a large margin, but they vote more for the Republican for president than, than for the Democrat. But what we were seeing among that older voter group is that they were actually preferring Joe Biden. Uh, and so when we dug into the why, of that, why is that occurring? So the what is we're not getting as many senior citizen voters as we should be. And when we dug into the why, it was because they, re they did not feel that Donald Trump took the pandemic seriously. And they were worried because if you look at who was dying and who still is dying from, from the coronavirus, it was older people. So they had more to be concerned about than some 25 year old did in the pandemic. And so it was not so much that uh, they believed that Donald Trump was doing the wrong things uh, around the pandemic. They felt that his tone, so the emo this is emotional, his tone, how he talked about it, was uh, the problem. He was not taking it seriously. And we saw an even bigger dip with this group uh, for this exact same reason after he got COVID. So when he got COVID, he had a real opportunity to, to tell the American public, this is real. I just went through it. It was tough. I thank the doctors. I'm so grateful for our healthcare workers. I was worried as I went through this, and I'm so grateful that I'm, I'm healed now from this, uh, and I, I understand how you feel. If he had just said that, he would have won the election. I really think that his COVID diagnosis and how it was handled uh, was the difference between him winning and losing. 
Um, because the way American politics work, you have to win a certain number of states. It's not who gets the most votes. Uh, it's through the Electoral College of who wins the right amount of states and how many voters those states have in them. Uh, and there were a few states that the, the margin was less than two-tenths of one percent difference. Uh, and that difference was the senior citizen voters and, and how they viewed him and Joe Biden. And that was all, there was no logic involved with it. On behalf of uh, Budapest Land Group Agency, you took uh, a part in a parallel research in the United States and in Hungary, uh, examining the American presidential election. Mm -hmm. uh, many people in Hungary and abroad also wrote about this, so it was, it was everywhere in the news. Uh, did you get any uh, data what surprised you regarding by this research? What was really unique about the, the lounge group research that we were able to participate in uh, was the influences of political um, beliefs. So where, where does somebody form that they are a conservative or that they're a liberal or that they care about this issue or that issue? Um, and you would think that that would be culture and it would be the media, uh, celebrities, but uh, family was the number one factor. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. So now you have already an experience uh, about an Hungarian-American collaboration. How do you feel? What are the strong parts uh, in the U.S. and what are the strong parts in Hungary in terms of the working style? Well, I think one thing that is really special about the Hungarian people is that they are they're very proud of their country. Uh, and that's something that Americans also feel. Um, Hungarians also, from my experience so far, uh, are very warm and welcoming, and, and it just makes the collaboration so much easier when, when the, the people have similar um, belief systems. You have a favorite books, and which book are you reading at the moment? Uh, recently been reading a lot of books around how to be a better leader, um, because I realize that who my company needs me to be tomorrow is not who I am today. And so if I'm gonna keep leading our team uh, and growing our team, then I have to become a better leader as part of that. Um, but one thing that I've recently realized is that it's not about doing more, it's about doing better of what you do. Uh, and so I'm, I just started a book on the plane over here called Work the System. Uh, and it's about how do you build systems and processes that become the function of the business so that the people can become the brains and the heart of the business. Do you have uh, any mentor in your life or somebody whom you very much respect on your field? Uh, there's a lot of good pollsters in, in our business. Um, one of them is actually my counterpart, but for Joe Biden. His name is John Anzalone. And uh, he was Joe Biden's pollster. Uh, I was helping on the Trump campaign and we actually lived in the same city in Alabama. You know uh, each other, you're We friends. do, yes. Um, and he's a really great guy. And um, there's also a guy in, uh, on the Republican side uh, named Dave Sackett. Uh, at a com he's a competitor, but uh, he does such a good job explaining the information, using humor. Um, his, his calls where he explains the data, usually there's more laughing than anything else. Um, but, but really, I would say my biggest mentors from a, a business perspective in general uh, is that I spend a lot of time reading books and listening to podcasts of these business leaders. And there's people like John Maxwell, uh, who has written, I don't know, 40 or 50 books on business. But uh, it, it's really more about how can you be a better person? Because if you're a better person, a more caring person, a more empathetic and understanding person, that has impact in all areas of your life. It's interesting because we are talking about emotions, we are talking about uh, that you have to be a good person, to be a good leader, to have a good company, to, to uh, reach a high success uh, on your field. But uh, more and more we uh, hear about AI, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. how much it's uh, influencing your field. Uh, I think it's going to eventually change what we do. It already changes what's out there right now. I mean, when you go on the internet, you're under the influence of artificial intelligence. Um, you know, these cars that are eventually gonna be driving themselves around. I mean, that's the power of artificial intelligence. But uh, I believe that artificial intelligence is, is really just a tool. It's not the end game. So it's something that's gonna be beneficial and helpful. Um, we already use it in, in our data science. 
So uh, when, because in America we have access to so much more data uh, than is available in Europe or really in, in any other part of the world, because um, there is no privacy in America, <laughs> at least with your data uh, right now, that uh, we, can, we can model the, the likelihood that somebody's gonna vote for a candidate. We can use artificial intelligence to figure out that they care about the economy more than they care about a healthcare issue. Uh, and so we're already using artificial intelligence as a tool, but you have to have a, you have to have a goal for why you're gonna use it in the first place. Um, just because it exists and it can, it can do these wonderful things, it's more important to, to understand why do I need to use this artificial intelligence. If now at the end of the interview we would be uh, able to provide you a high-end machine, what uh, can give you the answer for any question uh, regarding the mankind, what would be this only one question of yours, what you would ask? For men specifically, it would be to understand what women actually mean when they say, would you like to help clean the dishes? Because I, I have learned the answer is, is, is not a question. It is a statement posed as a question. <laughs> <laughs> so not meaning of life. This no. Is, this is a much more it important is, question. That, that's a much more applicable question because I can use it every day. <laughs> you can talk about emotions about this. And <laughs> yes. I know. How do I feel about it? <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel about this? <laughs> thank you so yeah. much for the interview. No, thank thank you. you for the opportunity. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you.